So um, I guess I'm competing against Qdoba. Um, hopefully I can get some info in before you enter queso comas. Um, I feel bad for anyone attending virtually, missing out. Um, but I'm here today to talk a little bit about gender affirming hormone therapy for our transgender population. And I know you guys um, do some of this in your resident clinic as well. So hopefully I can provide a framework or answer any questions that you guys have. Um, this will be pretty informal, so feel free to interrupt me anytime that you want. I'm just going to go over a general overview, um, and um, we'll see what questions you guys have. So um, in getting started, I wanted just to say that um, this is still an area of medicine that is a little bit controversial. And so um, it's totally understandable if your personal beliefs don't align with providing gender-affirming hormone therapy. Um, but there are a lot of providers that will do this, so please refer your patients appropriately if you personally do not want to give them hormone therapy. Um, also, I'm going to talk mainly about using um, hormone therapy in adult patients, um, but of course this is something that can be done in adolescents as well. And again, this is not just for endocrinologists alone. You guys can also prescribe hormone therapy. Um, and then there are a lot of different protocols to do this, and I'm going to use mainly the um, WPATH guidelines and the Endo Society guidelines. And then every state law is different, so be aware of what is approved in your own state if you are going to provide gender-affirming care. Um, in Kentucky, there are no laws specifically prohibiting us from doing this, nor are there laws protecting patients with transgender identity um, and ensuring that they receive care. So every state's a little bit different. All right. So some overview um, generic goals of today is to define what gender affirming care is and how hormone therapy plays a role, and then to talk about the strategies in providing this and some guidelines. So first, we should talk about the types of transition in transgender patients. So obviously, there's social transition. So this is when they start presenting as their um, true gender identity in the way that they dress, in their preferred name, in their pronouns. Um, and physically outwardly presenting as the gender they choose. Of course, legal transition um, is something that requires court documents and they change their gender marker on their ID and they legally um, change their gender on other documentation and change their name. But medical transition is where we play a role and this can be use of medications and use of surgery to create um, their um, desired gender identity. Some definitions going forward. Um, so this is something that was introduced to me as a fellow, and this is the gender-bred person, and I think it just kind of outlines what all these terms mean, because um, um, some things we take for granted um, that they're associated with each other, but they actually are unrelated. So just for example, someone's um, gender expression is what they look like on the outside. So that's that um, gender-bred person's, their icing, their buttons, what kind of decorations they have on the outside, how they outwardly express themselves in society. So gender expression, um, has nothing to do with gender identity because there are certainly um, cis women or biologic women that like to dress in a more masculine fashion. And similarly, um, one may argue skinny jeans on a guy might be an expression of a more feminine identity, but not necessarily. So gender expression is not necessarily related to our identity. Our gender identity is what gender we believe we are inside, um, whether you think you're male or female, regardless of your biologic sex that you were born with. Um, your biologic sex is therefore, you know, your genitalia, your chromosomes, your reproductive organs, and what you were born with. And your sexual orientation means who are you attracted to? Um, and we put this in terms of their gender identity um, rather than um, their biologic sex. So again, biologic sex, just to review, can be female or male or intersex. Um, and it's related to the physical body parts their chromosomes, um, and not necessarily their gender identity. So when a person has a gender identity that doesn't align with their biologic sex, um, so they were born with, um, with testicles and a penis and XY chromosomes, but they feel like they're a woman, um, that is a transgender person. But when that causes significant distress in their lives um, and alters their functioning, that's when we refer to them as transgender or genderqueer. And that's when medical therapy plays a role. So um, again, cis refers to someone whose gender identity aligns with their biologic sex, and transgender means 
that they are not in alignment. So thinking back to our OCHEM days and remembering what those terms mean. Um, so other things that we should keep in mind. A lot of patients will have what we call a dead name, which means that's the name they were legally born with. It's on their birth certificate, but it doesn't fit with their gender identity. And a lot of times when a patient chooses to present socially, that's when they'll create their preferred name. And so we should try not to use their dead name unless it's for legal reasons or insurance reasons. Uh, we should try to refer to them by their preferred name as much as possible. And usually I just walk in a room and I make no assumptions and I just say, hey, I'm Dr. Ravel. Um, what do you like to be called? And then that kind of opens up the door. And so, um, of course, people can refer to themselves by different pronouns, um, whether they're feminine, masculine, or non-binary. And then um, we should also know different documentation for transgender identities. So um, some other terminology you may see for a transgender man might be female to male, FTM, AFAB, which stands for assigned female at birth. Um, and so similarly, those um, um, abbreviations exist for every transgender identity. When someone can't really say necessarily they're male, female, they're somewhere in the spectrum, we consider them non-binary. And other terms for non-binary include gender fluid, um, gender creative, gender incongruent, gender expansive. One term we don't use anymore um, that I should have struck through is gender non-conforming because it has a negative connotation by saying that they're not conforming to something. Things we should not use. Um, we no longer use the term gender identity disorder um, and we should not refer to people as transsexual. So um, to prescribe hormone therapy, if you have a patient that wants to start the medical transition, um, the requirements to start this would be that they have to have persistent gender dysphoria. So there are, there's evidence that their gender identity and not being able to express themselves or physically be that um, is causing dysfunction in their lives, mental illness, substance use, legal issues, relationship issues, etc. They have to be able to have capacity to receive medical care just like any patient. And any mental health concerns that are there should be reasonably well addressed. That doesn't mean that they have to be um, completely stable, but if they have other mental health diagnoses, they should be seeking care for them. And so nowhere in there does it say that they have to have a psychiatrist um, before starting mental health uh, or gender affirming care. No one in there does it say that psychiatrist has to approve them for this before they start. We are all capable of um, making this diagnosis and asking the relevant questions and deciding whether or not they have gender dysphoria. So the goals of gender affirming care. So patient goals vary. And so again, I never make assumptions. Um, and so I ask a series of questions. So I ask them, you know, what is it you're hoping will happen? Um, what do you think is going to change about you physically, emotionally, sexually? A lot of times patients don't realize that gender affirming care sometimes actually changes their sexual expression as well and their sexual preference. So that's a conversation to have because that can cause distress if they have pre-existing relationships. And I ask them, what is it that you hope will happen at the end of this? Who are you going to look like? What are you going to be? And what aspects of your biologic sex actually trigger your dysphoria? A lot of times people will say that it's um, their voice, um, that you know, physically they can pass as their gender identity, but their vo as soon as they speak, they get misgendered. Um, some people will say their genitalia triggers them. Some people, trans men will say having a cycle triggers them, and everyone's different. So knowing what triggers them is going to guide where we focus our initial plan of care. Are we going to focus on medications or are we going to start sending out referrals for surgery, voice therapy, etc.? And then my goals are to be respectful of them, make them feel safe, and that includes educating my clinic staff on how to address transgender people appropriately and how to ask correct questions. So that's not always very easy, but um, a work in progress um, in our center. And then with hormone therapy, I should reduce their endogenous sex hormones and replace it with hormones that affirm their gender identity. And I have to manage expectations. And that's a big part of it. And of course, minimize complications and provide safe care. So how do we um, consider what referrals to place? Um, there are a lot of other specialists that can help in transition. So that might include gender affirming speech therapy. We have really good speech pathologists with U of L. Um, under the care of Lisanne Craven, 
and you can put that referral in an EPIC for transgender men. There are gender affirming surgeons in the area, both with Norton and U of L, um, and obviously in other parts of Kentucky and other states. Um, there are mental health services. Reproductive endocrinology is going to play a role in anyone that wishes to preserve their fertility before starting hormone therapy, and then referring them for hair removal if needed. So, one thing that I think will be really helpful if you choose to do this is framing this in terms of puberty, because that's what we're doing. We're basically creating another puberty. And so even this morning, I had a patient that's been on hormone therapy for coming up on two year, two year anniversary, um, and is really upset because they haven't had the chest growth they're hoping to see. Um, they're still having to shave their face every two days, um, and things of that nature. So um, framing this as puberty helps them to realize what's gonna happen and when. If all y'all remember, if your puberty was anything like mine, it was long, it was awkward, um, it was emotionally stressful, and so that's what they should expect. Um, they won't see peak effects until two to three years of hormone therapy. And initially, it's gonna be a long waiting game. At your three-month follow-up, they're gonna see no change. At your six-month follow-up, they're probably gonna see no change. And the things that happen first are all the things we don't want to have happen. Um, transgender men are going to notice their skin's going to become oily. They're going to get acne. They're going to start to smell bad. They're going to have to get a stronger deodorant. Their voice is going to crack. And they're going to get teased by their friends. Um, transgender women are going to notice nothing. Um, so, you know, those are things to, to kind of outline with them so that they are not feeling rushed and that they don't use off-label therapies or do things kind of um, without prescriptions. And then it's important to tell them what's reversible and what is irreversible once we start this process. This is more relevant in transgender men because certain changes with testosterone cannot be reversed once they happen. Fertility is a big one, and fertility is not technically irreversible, um, but to preserve fertility or regain fertility, they would have to stop hormone therapy for a significant period of time, and a lot of times that is triggering and stressful for them. And then make sure they know how often you should expect to see them. So if they're on testosterone therapy, because it's a controlled substance, you should expect to see them every six months at least. Um, in general, I see patients every three months until their hormone levels are therapeutic, and then I space it out from there. All right. So now that we kind of know the basics, um, we'll talk about some guidelines. Um, and so I won't go into them in nitty gritty and all that, but these are the guidelines that are there if you wish to read them. Endocrine Society has practice guidelines. And additionally, additionally the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, um, I didn't update this, but they just came out with their eighth version of their guidelines last year. So those are available as well. So any questions so far? OK. Anyone in a rice coma? OK. All right. So. Feminizing hormone therapy. So for our trans women, how are we going to go about this? So the most important thing is that we want their estradiol level to be in the range of 100 to 200. And the reason we picked that range is because we know that that's a good compromise on an estrogen level that's going to maintain their bone health. Um, because once we suppress their testosterone, there's not going to be enough testosterone to aromatize to estrogen. So that's why we picked that goal. And we can do this through oral estrogen, which um, I recommend they dissolve under their tongue to get maximal absorption. I'm told it tastes kind of minty, so it doesn't seem to cause any problems. There can be transdermal estrogen and parenteral, um, which is dosed either every 7 or 14 days. Um, parenteral um, estrogen is associated with the highest risk of venous thromboembolism and PE, and transdermal is associated with the least risk. So those are things to keep in mind if someone is high risk or has had a blood clot before. And then that's gonna be the main thing that's gonna get our estrogen level therapeutic and our testosterone suppressed. But there's a role for androgen blockade in getting rid of those other physical characteristics that cause them dysphoria. So androgen blockade is gonna help us to reduce acne, reduce um, scalp hair loss, and to slow the growth of body and facial hair. And so it has no role in their actual hormone levels. The most commonly used is spironolactone, um, and usually I start at a dose of 50 milligrams a day, and I titrate up to a max dose as tolerated. 
Um, and then in the States, we can also use bicalutamide, and in other countries, they also use ciproterone. Um, I've used finasteride also off-label um, if someone has a lot of side effects from spironolactone, but it's not necessarily part of the guidelines. It still does the same thing. So some starting regimens. So usually if I'm starting oral estrogen, I'll do one milligram sublingual daily, and then at their three-month follow-up, I'll check their levels and I'll start up titrating. With estradiol valerate, um, you give 10 milligrams every 14 days. The max dose is going to be um, 40 milligrams per month. In transdermal, you can do 0 0.1 um, milligram patch per week with a maximum of 0 0.4 um, twice weekly. And then spironolactone, as we talked about. The goal is to start really low, and at the three-month visit, again, they're not going to have a lot of changes, they're not going to be therapeutic, but just to make sure nothing crazy happens from estrogen. Some physical effects they're going to see. So the main one that most times they're looking for is breast growth. Um, they initially won't even notice growth. They're going to notice tenderness and kind of sensitivity around the nipple area and maybe some discharge. Thought behind the galactorrhea is basically that in creating breast tissue, we're not really doing uh, female puberty in, in the natural sense, but basically we know that there are you know, um, muscular elements and glandular elements in the breast tissue. And so we're going to build the glandular elements before the muscle parts have have been there, so there's nothing to keep the milk in there um, if there is um, milk production. So that's kind of why there's galactorrhea. And then they may notice direct, decreased erectile function. They should still have an intact libido, but with estrogen therapy, they won't be able to perform. They'll notice decreased testicular size, a distribution in their body fat, so more um, weight in the rear end and in the thighs and less in the abdomen. And then they're going to notice a decrease in their muscle mass. Again, these things peak after two, three years, and so um, really the first changes they're going to notice are going to be changes in their, um, their skin and their hair texture. They're going to start notice sexual dysfunction probably very early on, um, and a change in their sex drive initially that rebounds. Um, and so I kind of reference this chart when I'm with patients because it gives them an idea of what to expect and to not be quite so impatient. Questions about feminizing therapy? Yeah. Yeah, good question. So the question is if we have to monitor um, their, you know, coagulation indices. And so, not really. There's no kind of correlation there. Um, I kind of educate them on obviously the signs and symptoms of PE and DVT. Um, but uh, most of the time, it's a very rare complication. Um, and if I have, if they're high risk, then I would have put them on a patch anyways. Yep, good question. All right, any other questions? All right, so masculinizing therapy. Mainstay is going to be testosterone, and we're going to try to suppress the estrogen and bring the testosterone level to between 400 and 700. And this can either be through injections, through patches, and then now there's actually... Um, there's gels and creams, and then there's also a tablet, which is called Tolando. Um, it's not readily available. It's very expensive, but it is there. Um, and they all have benefits and risks. So um, unlike estrogen, none of these testosterone formulations are associated with increased risk of any of the complications. Um, but um, transdermal, um, such as like gels and creams, is at risk of transfer. So if they have a lot of people in their family and household that don't want to be men, um, then maybe that's not the best option for them, especially if they have small children. I did have a patient whose daughter grew a little mustache, so not good. We don't want that. Um, and then with injectable, the downside is that you're technically giving yourself a big bolus of testosterone, and you're waiting 14 days, and then you're giving another dose. So there are going to be more swings in the levels and swings in mood, and a lot of times this is associated with increased aggression in some patients. And then if they are not having cessation of their cycle with testosterone when you're waiting for it to get therapeutic, because their cycle is usually pretty trigger, triggering for them, and there could be a role to add continuous progesterone to um, cause cessation of menses until they're therapeutic. Another thing they could do is consider an IUD or an um, Nexplanon implant, but a lot of times IUDs are kind of um, borderline because having anyone in that area is a little bit triggering for them. 
seven. Things that are going to happen with testosterone. First thing is you're going to smell bad. I'm telling you, it's the first thing that anyone says. So more body odor. And then voice cracking. Then they're going to notice deepening of their voice um, fully. They're going to notice that their menses will cease. They're going to have enlargement of their clitoris and growth of facial and body hair. And eventually they're going to have increased lean muscle mass. And they're going to have more abdominal fat deposition rather than visceral or subcutaneous fat deposition. Same thing, same timelines. So it takes three to six months before anything happens, a year before any of the good stuff happens, and two to three years for the peak effect. The changes that are not reversible, so once a male hair follicle grows somewhere on the body, it's never going away, or once a male type of sweat gland forms on the body, it's not going away. So those things won't change. Um, the growth of the soft tissue around the larynx that causes deepening of the voice that will not go away, and any um, bottom growth or clitoral enlargement will not be reversible. Complications um, of feminizing therapy. The most common ones that we look out for, of course, VTE and PE. There can be alterations in liver function and hypertriglyceridemia. And so um, kind of the, the weird thing about feminizing therapy is that it still is associated with increased risk of cardiovascular disease, even though women, if you take women that are postmenopausal, if we give them estrogen, it reduces their risk of cardiovascular disease. So there's a couple of theories of why that happens. And Honestly, my opinion is that just biologically being born as a male puts you at elevated risk a little bit. Um, and um, so that in itself um, leads to the continued increased risk compared, excuse me, <clears throat> compared to cis females. So it depends on who we're comparing it to when we say increased risk. If you were to com compare trans men to cis men, probably they have decreased risk of cardiovascular disease. And then also when giving someone estrogen, just like when we do it with birth control, there's a chance that there could be increased prolactin levels and we could unmask a pituitary adenoma. So usually at baseline and at their first follow-up visit, um, I check prolactin levels to see if there's any change. Um, there's a possible correlation with estrogen therapy and increased risk of type 2 diabetes, but I haven't seen that in any of my patients. And then there's no conclusive evidence that giving estrogen increases risk for breast cancer. But it is something I still screen for and ask if there's a high-risk family history because they will grow breast, breast tissue. All right. So labs that I monitor with estrogen therapy, um, I check their estrogen and testosterone at every visit. Um, I will check um, liver function tests and cholesterol, a prolactin, and I will also look at my potassium and renal function if they're on spironolactone. And then, of course, because of the VTE risk, we want to really, really push tobacco cessation and abstinence and provide any prescriptions for nicotine replacement therapy if we need it. Other things patients have told me that are kind of weird, so we talked about the galacteria, but um, some of my trans uh, women have also told me about urinary incontinence. And um, through looking through um, kind of reports and everything, it seems like estrogen therapy causes some softening of the pelvic floor muscles. And so um, usually this can be avoided by just advising them to do Kegel exercises, just like anyone with urinary incontinence. Um, and that usually helps. With male hormone therapy and testosterone, just like replacing testosterone in a cis man, we're worried about um, erythrocytosis and polycythemia. We worry about unmasking or worsening sleep apnea because we're causing growth of soft tissues in the neck can also alter your liver function and cause hyperlipidemia. And then, um, like I said, aggression can sometimes kind of pop up while we're using certain types of testosterone therapy. So monitoring for testosterone therapy, again, would be an estrogen and testosterone level at every visit, checking their lipid panel and their liver function, and monitoring their hematocrit. The absolute value for hematocrit, where we're not supposed to prescribe testosterone therapy anymore, is 54%. If a patient does develop that level of erythrocytosis, usually I'll recommend that we decrease the dose um, if they're kind of in the high end of the therapeutic range, or I'll just tell them to donate blood. And that's kind of what the WPATH and Endo Society advise us to do as well. And then um, do thorough, thorough screening for sleep apnea. Um, and, you know, 
make sure when you do your exam there's not a lot of oropharyngeal crowding ask them about snoring ask them about their sleep habits and please refer them to sleep medicine um, before starting testosterone therapy or before getting too high on the dose and then um, there were some recommendations to maybe start a baby aspirin um, to mitigate the cardiovascular risk or their erythrocytosis and there's no evidence behind that so it's basically practitioner specific and dependent. So if you think it will help, then go for it. Other considerations. So a good rule of thumb for these patients is, um, one, we should know what kind of gender affirming surgeries they've had, but keeping track of what body parts are still present. If that body part is capable of getting cancer, they should be screened for it as every, any other person. And that's kind of what I tell them. And my trans men, um, I usually tell them to take a female person with them to the gynae office because then they could say they're just accompanying that person. It's less dysphoric. They can kind of cover a little bit. Um, and there's less, you know, people staring and gawking. Um, and then also really keeping track of their bone health. And if they haven't had therapeutic hormone levels or they're not following up regularly and you're worried about their bone health, um, make sure you do get DEXA and advise them about how to um, prevent osteoporosis. So anyone that's in the workshop, 2 o'clock, will get some more advice on this from me. You'll be really sick of me by the end of the day, but we're going to talk about osteoporosis further. All right, so long-term studies. There's really only been this one really, really big long-term study, even though this has been done for decades. So this was um, a study of over five decades um, in a Dutch population. And basically what they found is they wanted to look at mortality causes in general for these transgender patients. And so they did find that transgender women, um, more so than transgender men, had increased mortality of any cause compared to the general population. And um, there was some also increased mortality in transgender men, but not as striking as the transgender women. So they wanted to look at what it was. It was it the medications we're using, was it was psychiatric, psychiatric illness, was it other things unrelated? So this chart is a little bit crazy, but <clears throat> Excuse me, bear with me. So um, compared to um, the general population, um, they kind of looked at transgender women and men separately. So if you look on the left side, this is just transgender women. So people that their biologic sex is male and they have transitioned with medicine um, to um, their gender identity of a transgender woman. So they compared them to cis men first and they looked at their mortality um, for different causes. So what you can see is that there was an increased risk of cardiovascular disease 1.4 times compared to um, cis men. Um, but compared to cis women, so those people that were assigned female at birth and did not have gender um, dysphoria and remained women, um, they had almost three times more likely um, to have cardiovascular disease related death. So that's pretty striking. Um, and it kind of highlights the importance of really monitoring cholesterol control, weight, et cetera, in these patients. Um, Cancer-related mortality, there was some increased mortality related to lung cancer um, and um, GI cancers um, compared to women. Um, they had much higher rates of infection, specifically HIV. Um, so this is where it's important to ask them about their sexual orientation. And an easy way to do it, to not get confused about when to use the term homosexual, when to use the term heterosexual, is I just ask them what gender their, their partners tend to be and they'll tell me. Um, and it goes that way. Um, if they have the biologic parts to have intercourse with someone of the opposite biologic sex, they should use barrier contraception. Um, if, they, uh, if there's someone that was born with um, male genitalia and they have um, intercourse with males, Again, barrier contraception. So, um, and then there's a role for PrEP there as well. And then um, I wanted to highlight also the increased uh, mortality from suicide. So um, checking in with them about their mental health is very important um, and being an ally is very important. And then we move on to the transgender men. So those that were born women and received hormone therapy um, to achieve their um, desired gender identity of man. Um, so. Really the most striking things here, again, is increased mortality from suicide um, and non-natural causes. Um, but compared to men and women both, there was maybe an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, not really an increased risk of cancer, 
not really um, data about infection. Any questions about that? Okay. So I think that's all I got. Um, any questions? Does anyone here prescribe? Oh, question. Yeah. Do you ever run into uh, issues with insurance and prescribing because you try to get a time to get rid of Yeah. Personal? Absolutely. Um, so it depends um, on their insurance and also what state their insurance is based in and how you document. So if I document um, one of their diagnoses is gender dysphoria in adults and then the other one, the second diagnosis I usually include in my visits is hormone replacement therapy. I found that that gets things through more because it's hormone replacement. Um, they don't see it as something extra you're doing. This is something they need, they're lacking and they need. Um, and so a lot of insurances do cover. What I have encountered, sadly, um, are pharmacies that um, refuse to fill based on their personal beliefs. Um, so do ask patients if, if that's you know kind of what it is. Try and get the exact um, discussion they've had with their pharmacy about why it wasn't approved, and then you can kind of figure out where the problem is. And then when it comes to surgery, that's where documentation is most important. Because um, insurances will cover gender-affirming surgeries a lot of times if they've been on hormone therapy for at least one year. So if you tell your patients when they, you know, schedule their procedure, it should not be a hysterectomy. It should be a gender-affirming hysterectomy. Um, usually it gets done and covered. Any other questions? Have any of you guys ever prescribed hormone therapy? Yeah, some of you, kind of. Okay. All right. So again, this is still a pretty controversial area and it's a growing area, but in Louisville we have a very large transgender population. So um, if any of you want to find out more, um, myself in, in U of L, I prescribe hormone therapy. Dr. Folsom with Norton prescribes hormone therapy. Um, Dr. Smith and Dr. Murphy also do as well, I think, Clay Smith and Dr. Murphy. So plenty of people to ask um, and reach out to. All right, well, thank you so much.